Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 6th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain how the Alaska House Coalition is lying to Alaskans. Second, we discuss why, after last week's developments, we're even more convinced that the current Permanent Fund Board should be sunset and replaced. And third, we explain why we believe Alaska's reporters are getting close to the real fiscal story, but aren't there yet. And then, as a bonus, At the end, Michael and I discuss Governor Dunleavy's job performance, and then at this point, where we see next year's legislative session heading. And now, let's join Michael. Good morning, Brad, and uh, welcome to the program. Uh, you got a you got a slam dunk, rambunctious a bunch of stuff for us today. Let's uh, let's get started on this because uh, again, reading through some of the details and some of the stuff on this, I just I'm going to shake my head. The first one of the weekly top three is this number one that the uh well you don't mince words too much the house coalition is lying to you and uh their front woman elise galvin has got a big piece up on opinion piece that uh i mean again i'll i'll let you take the reins here but the most annoying thing to me is the first sentence of this opinion piece alaska's public education system is in crisis and on the verge of collapse that's the first sentence of this screed. Uh, go ahead, Brad. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll let you take it away. <laughs> well, I, I I get past a few sentences before I before I hit mine that sends me sends me off into the stratosphere. But it is it's a it's a public opinion piece that was authored by Elise Galvin, but it's signed on by all the members of the Alaska House Coalition, and to me that means they read it, they agree with it, and they signed off on the substance. Uh, on the on the words that uh, that Elise Galvin used in it, it is it is a full on you know we've got to pay teachers more we've got to increase uh, 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 spending in schools more um, and uh, uh, and 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 you know all the things that that go with that. But here's the sentence that sent me off into the stratosphere. She she sets up you know we need more spending we need we need additional funds in the hands of teachers we need all sorts of additional funds in the hands of of K through 12 and here's here's the two sentences and there is a budget surplus so what's the hang up <laughs> this is this is a, this is an editorial signed off by all of the members of the Alaska House Coalition all of the members of the Alaska House Coalition are trying to tell Alaskans that there is a budget surplus. Now, you know, some Alaskans are sharper than others. Um, many are sharper, much sharper than me. Uh, but all you have to do is look at your PFD check and look at the statutory amount to know that there that there the, the amount that would have been set by statute to know that there is not a budget surplus. There is, in fact, a budget deficit, and they close the budget deficit by taking roughly $1.3 billion uh, out, of, out of the PFD, by cutting the PFD by roughly $1.3 billion. And, and that's a deficit. You, 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 that, that's a tax, as we've talked about on previous shows, as, uh, as ISA Professor Matt Berman has said, it's the most, it's the most regressive tax 
uh, ever. Um, and that's a tax and, the, and you're, they're using that tax to close. Guess what? A budget deficit. And so it's just irresponsible. It is, it is lying to Alaskans to claim that there's a budget surplus. It, th this whole piece, this whole piece would have been fine. I wouldn't have agreed with it, but it would have been fine without those two sentences. They, they threw those two sentences in gratuitously to mislead Alaskans, to make Alaskans think there's a budget surplus, so what the heck, we can just take more for, for K-12 through spending. What they're referring to, what their defense would be, is when Burt set up the budget, he set up uh, operating spending, uh, operating budget spending, capital spending, statewide spending, and then there is a line in the budget that's called pre-transfer surplus, about three hundred and five million dollars. And what there and 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 the reason he set that up is to have a, to have this budget set up to account for supplementals or for underages in oil price projections or all sorts of all sorts of things that could go on. Uh, before next session and in next session with the supplementals. It is, in essence, a contingency fund. Anybody who's right. put together a construction budget or anybody who's put together any sort of budget knows that you include a contingency amount. And Bert included in this budget a contingency amount. What what the what the but that contingency amount is funded like about a billion other about a billion other amount of this budget. Uh, is funded by PFD cuts. The the way he gets to a balanced budget, the way he gets to this 300 million surplus is by making a billion three in PFD cuts. And then he's got a billion three to play with and he took a billion to support spending uh, and he took 300 million of it to to create this this contingency amount. All the and so what the what the Alaska House coalition members would tell you is that it's 300 million, this budget's 300 million surplus. They have 300 million dollars, 300 million more do dollars more to play with that they could go out and they could fund increased K through 12 spending. So as Elise Galvin put it, and as all of the member, all of the members of the Alaska How House Coalition signed off on, so what's the hang up? But it's but it's not, it's 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 300 million dollars that's funded by PFD cuts. It's not a surplus. It is 300 million extra dollars that got taken out of the PFD in order to create in order to create this contingency amount. So it's just it's hugely misleading. It is hugely false. Um, it's just it's the Alaska House Coalition members lying to Alaskans in an effort to uh, in an effort to make their case. I I got to tell you, I, I lost a lot of. I mean, I had a lot of respect for some of the members, some of the members of the Alaska House Coalition, that they were trying, that they that they you know were trying to you know be responsible in how they balance the budget, that they were that they were you know making progress toward finding uh, alternative uh, revenues to help balance the budget, but all of them signed off on this, and I and I just I've lost respect for all of them. If any of them read that sentence and signed off. Every one of them read that sentence and signed off on this piece. That sentence is in a is in a jointly signed piece. Every one of them read read that sentence and signed off on that piece. If that's what they think Alaska's fiscal situation is in, then you know they have no business being representatives because they don't truly understand the fiscal situation the state's facing. Well, and it's it's interesting that you picked out that one sentence because I read the sentence and my brain basically said. Oh yeah, more of the same. I mean, I just you know, I mean, it was exactly what my brain said. So I didn't even think it was that unusual. But if you read this piece, this whole piece is essentially um, a regurgitation of every argument that they that they continue to say. Alaska has underfunded public education for more than a decade. Uh, again, it's on the verge of a collapse. Every poll shows Alaskans overwhelmingly su uh, support increased education funding. Well, what was the question that you asked? Then you get the budget surplus comment, and then it just keeps going on and on. This is a play-by-play, -play, basically, outline of what's coming up in January. 
I mean, she gets in defined benefits. She talks about all the different funding mechanisms. She talks about this ne- this false narrative of not increasing education. It is just going to be a it is it is last year 2.0. Only they're going to go whole hog, and this time they're going to include defined benefits in the whole program and everything else. But they're trying to reset the playing field, Michael. They're trying to say, oh, there's a budget surplus. So so why aren't you dealing with education fairly if you've got this budget surplus? I mean, they're counting on the Alaskans having the same reaction that you just described when they when that read that when they read that sentence, which is, oh, well, we've got a budget surplus now. What now? What are we going to do with it? We don't. We don't. Not even not even legislative finance, not not even the BERT directed legislative finance. Uh, uh, which is just a regurgitation of what Bert wants ever to what's it wants it to say at any given point in time. Not even legislative finance has claimed well that the budget that the budget is in surplus. And I I don't want maybe I miss maybe I misstated what I was saying. I looked at it and said, oh, more BS, more pushwa. Understanding that it's not maybe that maybe I wasn't clear enough on that, Brad. When I read that statement, I went. <laughs> Okay, I roll. Yeah, of course we've got a surplus because you're sucking the PFD dry. We've got a surplus. That's not a real surplus. So to me, it was just more of the same. It didn't stand out as much as it did to you. But again, it's all part and parcel, this whole thing. You could see exactly where they're going to be going come January the 17th. Yeah, well, I I want outrage. When you read that, I want you to have outrage. I want everybody to have outrage when 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 they read that sentence. We are smarter than that. Alaskans are smarter. Than to, than to fall for the line that we've got a budget surplus. If that's, I mean, this is this is as bad. This is as bad as that as the trick that Natasha and Bert pulled in 2017 to restate the footnote that previously said uh, PFDs are designated funds. To take that footnote out and to start talking about them as as unrestricted general funds. And to treat them as just a regular part, a regular revenue source to the budget, as opposed to what they are, like every other designated general fund, statutorily designated for a certain purpose. And it's, I mean, that was an effort to change the words, change the playing field, change the debate, control the debate. And it, and it succeeded. This is the, this looks like to me, like the next step in that effort to change the words, to change the debate. And to and to and to you know create create a different outcome as a result of just you know taking out a footnote in the case of 2017, or now we're going to start calling it budget surplus, even though we're cutting the budget, right? Even though we're cutting permanent fund dividends, we're going to call it magically call it a budget surplus, right? Sprinkle fairy dust on it, and it's a budget surplus. That it, it's an attempt. This is an attempt to normalize. To, 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 to explain away, to, to use words to explain away something that just isn't true. And, I, and, and we need to call it out for that at the time it occurs. I think a lot of Alaskans are smart, but I think a lot of Alaskans are ignorant of the process and they'll buy into that. Even though they're smart people, they'll buy into that because they're ignorant of the process itself. That's part of the problem. The, the low information, not you know, voters, the people who don't understand exactly how the process works. They'll be like, oh, OK, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, you know, kind of thing. And you're right. It's an attempt to capture the language. It's an attempt to change the to change the argument and change the, the vocabulary. And that's, but you know, not shocking. Donna actually makes a valid point. She goes, the most disturbing part of the op ed is that more money will fix Alaska's education system. I mean, you're 100 you're 100 percent right. I mean, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over. Here we are at the top of the heap as far as student expenditures. Uh, in the country, we're in the top one, two, three, somewhere in there. And yet they just say, well, what we need is more money. I mean, it would be better if we were at the top of the heap for spending, but we're at the bottom of the heap for educational outcome. But what we really need is more money, more money, uh, M-O-A-R, more. Uh, and that's, it's, it's just, it's, it's insane. It's frustrating and it's insane. I absolutely disagree that that's the most disturbing part. I mean, yes, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a disturbing part. It is not the most disturbing part. Go back to 2017, and what happened when they changed the language in 2017 to to eliminate the the footnote that said permanent fund dividends are designated funds. Designated funds for those who for those who you know want the catch up version of the show. Designated funds are funds that are statutory designated for a certain purpose. Constitution says you can't dedicate funds 
So they're not dedicated. The, the legislature can move them around, but they are designated for a certain purpose. And and it is it, it, it is not common for the legislature to go in and grab designated funds. And another example of designated funds are the tuition that's paid for by the by UAF, UAA, for, by the college students in the state. Those are designated for a certain purpose. They're designated for for use by the university, but they're not dedicated for that purpose. And the legislature can go grab them and use them for other purposes. The legislature doesn't do that, though. And 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 up to 2017, we had had the PFD in the same way. What happened in 2017 is they dropped the footnote. They started treating permanent fund uh, permanent fund uh, earnings, including the dividend portion, as UGF as unrestricted general funds, and said we could spend it on anything. And that change in the language is what opened the door to what we've had since. Uh, newspaper articles that say, "Yeah, they're UGF. Yeah, you you can spend them on anything." And, and, and a whole era of, of legislators and newspaper reporters and newspaper editors and, and people commonly talking about those stu- that stuff as unrestricted general funds. This is exactly the same thing. This is an attempt to change the language and say, those PFD cuts, don't worry about those. That, that isn't, that isn't a, a, a deficit, a budget deficit. That really created a budget surplus. It's an effort. It's an Orwellian effort. To change the to change the language in a way that favors favors spending those funds, uh, treating those funds as as surplus funds. If you cut the PFD, they're surplus funds. We can spend them on anything. Don't worry about the PFD. We haven't we haven't mistreated it. It's just it's it's gone anyway. Despite the statute, and 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 I think the most insidious part of this op ed. K through 12, sort of a sort of a, a an issue of the moment. This is a fundamental about fiscal policy going forward. If we start treating PFD cuts as surpluses, then we we've, we've entered a, an, another entirely different era about how we're going to put the, put these budgets together. <clears throat> Donna says, if we're debating about which is the worst part of this op-ed, we can conclude that it's really bad. <laughs> And I would agree. It is really, really bad. This op-ed, like I said, this this op-ed reads like a planning memo for the next phase of the battle. You could see how they're going to, th- and I agree with Brad, they're attempting to capture the language and change the whole narrative to somehow, we have a surplus, so we should be able to spend it. Uh, even though that surplus is on the backs of Alas- uh, uh, backs of Alaskans uh, and their PFD and everything we just talked about with with Rob Meyer yesterday on Meyer Monday Meyer's Monday, we were talking about how the fact that ICER, even though ICER said pulling the lever on the permanent fund is the worst thing that they can do to the economy, that was just on raw spending. That had that was no analysis on investment. Uh, and what we have now is we have a tremendous amount of malinvestment in the market because the state is taking that money and it's not being invested by the private citizenry, um, which is all part and parcel of this whole thing. It's it's insane. All right, Brad. <clears throat> Are you ready? All right. <laughs> Read Brad's face. He is ticked off. I'm disappointed. Some of these members, some of these, some of these members of the Alaska House Coalition, I thought we're, we're making progress toward understanding Alaska's fiscal situation. And, and Elise wasn't one of them. And if this were just, was solely signed by Elise, then okay. Yeah. It's just, it's just sort of par for the course for her, but other, but it's, it's signed by the entire Alaska House Coalition. Every last one of them signed off on that sentence. Cliff Grow, who claims to be, you know, the fiscal expert, uh, in this, in the, in the legislature, people look up to him. People look for him. For, he signed off on that, and that's just. I mean, it's no <laughs> fiscal expert, no one no. who understands Alaska's fiscal situation should be signing off on that sentence. All right, let's move on to number two, which was the permanent fund board and what took place in Saudi Arabia this week, uh, and your why your contention is still that the entire permanent fund board should be overturned and replaced. Brad. Yeah. So after, uh, so last Monday, there was a meeting of the permanent for, board, permanent fund board at which they considered various paths uh, forward. One of those was to substantially increase the risk that the board's undertaking, uh, that the, that the board's undertaking with its investments in an effort to get super returns, returns above the 5% historic target they've had, move those returns 
in, in, with inflation or in, before after inflation up to the seven percent range by taking more and more and more risk. Well, the problem to get to get higher and higher returns. Problem with more and more risk is it doesn't always pan out. You end up with you know with losses, and those losses may overwhelm the gains, and you may end up going backwards as opposed to going forward. Um, and the board uh, uh, in that Monday meeting meeting did not adopt that strategy. Um, and the question we had last week was, well, what's my reaction to that? My reaction was, well, that's fine, but there are other steps there. You know, there's another board meeting in December. Let's not, let's not, you know, just assume that that's the end of it. Let's assume it may come up, uh, may come up again. Subsequent to the Tuesday show during the course of the week, it came to light that in, a, in a, in a panel session in Saudi Arabia, uh, a week or two before uh, the Monday board meeting, Ellie Rubenstein, who's one of the of the board directors, had been on a panel in Saudi in Saudi Arabia and was bragging about about this proposal by the board to get to 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 adopt this new strategy of going forward with higher risk in an effort to get to a hundred billion dollars to push the get super returns in an effort to get to a hundred billion dollars uh, value in the in the permanent fund. And, and if you watch that panel discussion and then look at all of the commentary around the panel discussion since, what that's what she's really doing is saying, and she called she called that proposal, by the way, my baby during the course of the panel discussion. What she really what she's really saying is, look at me. I'm getting the Alaska Permanent Fund to the what she called the hundred billion dollar club, the hundred billion dollar in value club, the most sovereign uh, wealth. Sovereign wealth, Sovereign, fund. yeah. The 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 most uh, uh, the biggest uh, Ala or uh, United States sovereign wealth fund in the United States, the biggest uh, investment fund, uh, state investment fund uh, in the United States. Look at me, I'm I'm really doing this. And the more I've watched that tape, the more I've looked at the commentary. What we're really in the middle of is an ego trip. What I'll, what the Alaska Permanent Fund Board is really in the middle of is an ego trip. They want to be. They want to get us to the hundred billion dollar club. They want to be with the big boys. They want to be part of the you know the Saudi the Saudi Arabian investment at the level with the Saudi Arabian Arabian investment group. They want to you know be thought of in the same terms as the Norway um, investment. We want to be we want to be major players. Us permanent fund board members want to be major players. She said something. So I one I think they're on an ego trip. Two. Well, and also in support of one is during the permanent fund board meeting, they considered opening a bunch of a bunch of new offices, London, Singapore, New York City, great places to travel to. Oh, and as board members, we'd have to go to, you know, be seen in those places. They also and Michael, this is the thing that really ticked me off. Dermot Cole has this in his reporting. They also approved a budget of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for global communications. What the hell is that? I mean, to, uh, why does the Alaska Permanent Fund Board need global communications? What we need are good investments. We don't need to be bragging about the investments. We need to be making those investments. Oh, it's all about marketing, Brad. It's all about marketing. Come and, on. And, and a 250000 budget, you know, for global communications is nothing more than, a, than, you know, to promote Ellie, to promote, you know, the members of the board as, hey, we're big, big members. There's one other thing that Ellie said that originally I didn't focus on, but as I went back and listened to the tape over and over and over again, it gradually dawned on me what she was saying. She said, this is a board of politicians. She's the only non-politician on the board. And some people, Dermot include, included, sort of ignored that and said, well, she was that, that was just a misstatement. It's not. Look at that board. You've got Adam Crum, who clearly is running for governor. If he, <laughs> if he if he can't run for state if he can't run for U.S. Congress he's running for governor. Jason Bruni, who's also rumored to be in the mix to run for governor. Craig Richards, who you know views himself as the power behind any throne that's up there. He used to be Walker's attorney general. Then he had a split with Walker, and all of a sudden he's he's Dunleavy's best friend, uh, and and stays on the board because he's Dunleavy's best friend. Sort of the 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 fixer, the power behind the throne. Uh, of Alaska, we do have a political board. We do have a board that's 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 full of politicians, and that's and and their egos and their desire 
to drive the fund forward so they can use that as part of their campaigns is part of what's going on here. We have lost lock. One, one of the things as you go through the la- as you go through that board meeting that you understand is that we were saved by the board of advisors, the board of real money managers, the board of real investment people that advise the that advise the permanent fund board. And to a person, they said, look, this, this, this expectation of getting to 7% return in the current environment is just foolish. You're just going off on a, on a fool's errand. You're putting the fund at risk. It's a bad thing. They were the grownups in the room. And what that really made, and, 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 the, and Jason and Adam and Ellie all pushed them and said, oh, now, come on, really, you know, how do we get to 7% real rate of return? You know, tell tell us the secrets of how we get there. And they all said, there are no secrets. You can't get there. You're putting the fund at risk by doing it. What what you come to realize as you as you sort of walk through that is that's the kind of board we want. We want the right. advisory board right. as members of the board. And if and if we're going to have politicians anywhere, anywhere around this thing, we're going to have people on ego trips anywhere around this thing, they can advise it. They can advise the board. But we want grown-ups running this board, not people on ego trips of I'm, I'm in the hundred billion dollar club or look, I'm running for governor. Look, look what I've done as I was, as I've been permanent fund, uh, uh, permanent fund board trustee. Well, the, we, and, we, we need to replace this board. And, and that's really some of the things that struck me in this article that Dermot wrote uh, at, talking about this and some of the quotes come back to, you know, you know what this really reminded me of this reminded me of Natasha. Uh, because here you have another, you know, uh, woman who came in and under, you know, daddy's money or whatever. And, and she I mean, she name drops this whole thing. You know, oh, my dad was so disappointed when they said they were pulling back from their uh, from their investment, uh, from their investment projections, you know, down from 19 percent. Oh, dad was so disappointed. And then talking about how she's pushing the woman in the workforce and the ESG and all. Look, I don't care about any of that. I want the best return and the most stable fund for the investment that it can be. And these people are all coming in with agendas that have nothing to do with what's best for the state of Alaska. It's what's best for them is what's going. You could see it. This, I mean, again, yeah. very reminiscent of what Natasha was doing. This, this is a fund. This is a board that's been appointed by the governor without vetting by the legislature, without public vetting. Because one of the things when you have to go through vetting by the legislature, you go through public vetting as well. You get a sense of, of what, uh, of what, of how people react, what people think about, you know, that, that particular person or, or that particular role uh, being on the, being on the per- permanent fund board. So we've got really unvetted people uh, that the governor's put on there who clearly, at least some of whom have a political agenda, some of whom have an ego driven agenda, um, uh, all of whom sort of, you know, <laughs> put, put, you know, the, 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 the real role of the permanent fund board to be a steady progressive, you know, Play it, play it by the book. Get get more funds. Don't overstretch. All of whom put that uh, aside in their effort to satisfy their ego or satisfy their own personal political agenda. We we don't we don't have a board of grownups, a board of investment professionals uh, running this show. Thank God we have it in the advisory board, and they push back. But we don't have that on the board itself. And I and I think. Clearly, what this sets up is we need to sunset the board, just like we did the Alaska Public Utilities Commission at the end of the 1990s when they went off, when they flew off into the stratosphere somewhere. Sunset the board, set up a new board uh, that is based on, you know, sort of says, hey, everybody who was on the advisory board, that's who we want on the on the on the permanent fund board. That that sort of role, those sorts of people, those sorts of that sort of experience, that sort of understanding. That sort of knowledge. That's who we want uh, on the permanent fund board. Stagger it um, and uh, and make it subject to legislative approval uh, and and reset what we're doing with the permanent fund board because this one is showing us how how far they can spin off into the universe. And I don't think it's over yet. I mean, people say, well, they 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 tamped it down. This they don't think it will come back. I'm I'm kid. I'm not kidding you. Ellie Rubenstein's on a drive to be a part of the hundred billion dollar club. By gosh. And and I I don't think this thing's dead yet, given given the players we have on that board. So I I think this legislature really needs to take a hard look at what we've got on the permanent fund board. One interesting fact um, that Nat Hertz reported in, in in on his blog, in his interesting things blog, Kathy Geisel hired Angela Rodell 
for this coming legislative session. Now, I don't know exactly what she's up to. I don't know exactly why she why she did that. But one thing that Angela would say, I think as well, is that this board is spun off, that this board is not is not pursuing the 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 goal that the legislature has set for it, that Alaskans have set for it. Um, and um, and it, it's intriguing that that Giesel thought to hire Angela at this particular time. But I think one of the things this legislature needs to be doing is looking at sunsetting the permanent fund board and reconstituting the permanent for, fund board in a wholly different way uh, based on experience and based, based upon public vetting as opposed to as opposed to what we got now. Well, especially looking at the makeup of the board, we got people on there that obviously don't have the history of, I mean, Adam Crum and Craig Richardson of uh, of deep long term investing. Like you said, the advisory board experience needs to be on the regular board as uh, as well. And for people who would argue that, well, if you do that and open it up to thing, then you'll just politicize it. It's totally politicized right now. Any governor can go in there and, and clean clean all house out with no oversight or anything else. I would just argue that uh, at least in the public process, we'd get some betting on what's going on, and that would probably be a good idea. I don't. I don't think if we had public vetting, I don't think Adam Crum ends up on the board. I think people see Adam Crum for what he is, which is a wannabe governor, uh, and say, "Look, you know, go go do that on somebody else's dime. Don't do it. Don't do it with permanent fund board money." I think Jason Bruni uh, probably ends up in the same place. Uh, don't don't do that on uh, on. Don't run for governor on on the on permanent fund board money. Uh, go do that. Uh, go do that on your own nickel. So I, I just I, I, I think public vetting would would, in legislative vetting would help a lot in this situation. Yeah. It, it wouldn't. It, it it may not show up in terms of would Adam Crum reject be rejected or would Jason Bruni rejected. I don't think they'd even get nominated, because I think the concern any administration's concern would be, well, that's just going to trigger off a political war. We don't need that. And look, we got all these professionals out there who really know how to run this business, really know what this business is. Let's just go appoint one of them, you know, stay. Somebody who actually knows what they're doing. I mean, shocking. We should actually, you know, hire somebody that knows what they're doing. To me, it was insane. The people that they were putting on this board who had no experience in those kind of maneuvers. I mean, my thought was historically the board has been um, you know, pretty uh, disconnected necessarily from politics in general. It was all about building the fund and continuing to grow the fund and the expertise to do that. And it just seems like over the last 10 years, that fundamentally has shifted uh, away from this. It's been, it's been, it's been bankers, investment fund managers. I mean, people who, who aren't running for governor, people who, who have a fairly low profile, uh, you know, stick to the knitting of, of making money, stick to the knit, uh, the knitting of, of investing and, and looking at, uh, at rates of return stuff that, uh, stuff that isn't, you know, isn't, isn't, uh, uh, I, I, I candy and stuff that isn't, you know, may, doesn't make you intensely popular, but, uh, but stuff that's built the fund over the time to, you know, in excess of $60 billion, $70 billion. So um, that that's historically who, who's been on there. Steve Rieger, uh, a former state representative, was on the board, uh, was replaced by Jason Bruni. But Steve Rieger was on the board and Rieger was just very, you know, down to earth, just very level headed. Just, you know, we just need to keep the fund, uh, uh, just keep building the fund slowly. We need to be very careful about how we're making these investments because, you know, even though it's 60 or $70 billion, it's only 60 or $70 billion. And you can lose that, you know, just read it wall street journal any given day and you can and see about, you know, how, how people lose fortune. So um, just, you know, very even keeled people. Now we've got, you know, ego trips of, I want to be, I want to be the hundred billion. I, it's my baby to get us to a hundred billion dollars. I want to be part of the hundred billion dollar club or, you know, Bruni, I'm running for governor. By gosh, I want uh, you know, I want a seven percent real rate of return. How do we get to seven percent real rate of return? The question. The advisory board. The advisory board says you can't get there. Oh, come on. All right. So how do we get to six point five percent? You know, it's just, it's we don't we we have people on there that don't understand uh, the investment markets. I mean, Jason's got a great background, but it's a great background in environmental protection and in oil and in and in almost everything but <laughs> in investments. Adam Crum, yeah, I just I'm not a big fan of Adam Crum and and that's just going to continually come through, but but one of the things he isn't 
is is a great investor. So I it's just we need we need to we need to step back and say this isn't where we want to go. We don't well, we don't want to be we don't want to be stretching the envelope and you know grabbing for the brass ring of a hundred billion dollars and then falling into the middle of the of the lion's pit when we miss it. We we want to be just a steady state, you know, stay on the same track, steady as we go, uh, 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 permanent fund building building toward you know whatever it's going to be, not not these artificial numbers out there that we have to hit in the next ten years. You could see that there's just people just trying to put another notch in their belt, another trophy in the case, another way to brag about what their accomplishments are. That's what it becomes about. It becomes about their own personal drive, their own personal goal instead of the overall goal of the fund. I mean, the, again, reading this article from Dermot Cole and seeing all these comments, and these are direct quotes from uh, from uh, Rubenstein on all these things. And you could see this is about her notching, you know, notching her stock on another uh, uh, you know, uh, on, on another win for I'm a woman. I did this a hundred million dollar club. I need to be part of it. This is my baby. This is what it's all about. It's not about what's good for the people. It's not about what's good for the fund. It's showing that she got there and she did it. You could see it. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's very much self-interest instead of, uh, instead of the overall interest of the funds. Exactly right. And that's what, you know, and some people will say, well, that's just the members we've got on there. If we change the members, it'll be okay. No, it, it's not. I mean, that's we're now seeing what happens when you have a gubernatorial only uh, appointment board and and you have a governor who is, I don't know, disengaged. Is that the word we're using right now? Uh, a governor who really isn't paying attention to, to, you know, to the basics, who's you know worrying about his about his next election when he runs against Lisa. Oh, don't worry. He's the fifth most popular governor in the country. Didn't you see that the other day? Yeah. <laughs> Amongst two, I don't know, but amongst apparently he's the fifth most popular governor in Alaska or in the country. He may be the fifth, the fifth most popular governor yeah. in Alaska. He may be. Uh, but but it's uh, it's uh, we, we need a professional board. This board has has demonstrated how bad you can get. Well, hopefully this is as bad as we can get. Hopefully we can't get worse. But it's demonstrated that this process produces a board that does this. We need to we need to wipe it just like we did with the Alaska Public Utility Utilities Commission in the late 1990s. We need to wipe it out and we need to start over again. Don't worry, don't worry, nothing's going to fall through the cracks. It's seamless, one to the other, uh, and and get a professional board and 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 keep going down the road that we've been going down. All right, we're continuing now. Brad Keithley is our guest. Uh, weekly top three continues. We're on to number three, which is. The press is starting to get it, but not 100%. They're starting to see some of it, but still not the whole picture, according to Brad. Brad, go ahead. All right. So um, the Cook Inlet is getting a lot of attention. Uh, uh, we talked about it on last week's show. We've talked about it on previous shows. You know, the fact that there's that there's a gas shortage and and now people are talking about, oh, what can the state do to, you know, to essentially create gas, you know, how much money and, and where should we be throwing the money? So, to, so, so it turns into, so it turns into gas. What the Dunleavy administration has proposed so far is, is reducing the state. We've already given away all the tax. There's no tax on Cook Inlet gas. Now that, now the Dunleavy administration has started to talk about subsidizing uh, Cook Inlet gas by reducing the royalty. In fact, eliminating the royalty. Uh, on new leases going to a net profits uh, uh, lease where the state doesn't get paid any royalty unless there's a profit uh, under the accounting system used by the producer. And uh, and and uh, uh, with respect to existing leases, uh, reducing royalty perhaps to zero uh, is, the gun, is the Dunleavy proposal. Nat Hertz, uh, who probably is, is one of the, certainly one of the top five, maybe uh, the best reporter that we've got uh, in the state, uh, doesn't work for an organization anymore. He writes his own blog. Uh, and uh, and this week came out with a piece that says, if Alaska wants more Cook Inlet gas, taxpayers should get ready to pony up. And and basically what Nat's article is, what Nat's piece is, is looking beyond what the governor's proposed to, to what may be coming next, uh, what may be in, in George Rauscher's mind that he's going to propose next, which is going back to the credit system uh, and giving producers money, trying to you know turn money into gas by giving producers money uh, 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 through credits, uh, tax credits, or through refundable credits where they just get the cash. 
giving producers money uh, in an effort to incentivize uh, additional pro uh, uh, production. I think that's wrong. And, and Nass got a great article, I think, for that, that picks that apart. He's sort of looking beyond to, to where we may be headed past what the governor past what the governor's proposed. But here's here's my thing with Nat. The headline, which is picked up, uh, is, is, is was the headline that Nat used when he put it on his own page. Is the headline now uh, that's being used when it's on the Anchorage Daily News opinion piece or opinion page, and and on the uh, Alaska Beacon opinion page. Here's the headline: If Alaska wants more Cook Inlet gas, taxpayers should get ready to pony up. He's exactly right. It usually when somebody sees that, you'll you'll get a comment that will go, "Oh, Alaska doesn't have taxpayers." I mean, the the oil companies are the taxpayers. They're the ones that they're the only ones that really pay tax. And so, you know what you what are you saying, Nat? That the oil company should get ready to pony up? No. We now have a tax. I mean, we've talked about it a lot on the show. PFD cuts are a tax. What Eisner's Matt Berman has talked has said are the most regressive tax ever. Um, and Nat's exactly right. Taxpayers should get ready to pony up. What Nat doesn't do is take that as a setup and talk about which taxpayers are going to get hit, which Alaskans are going to get hit. Who's going to pay for these credits? The, the, the piece is entirely about the credits themselves and how they likely won't be effective and how it's just throwing money, more money down the, down the, down the rat hole uh, at producers to try to get them temporarily to produce more gas. Uh, he doesn't talk, he doesn't back up and say, yes, my headline said taxpayers should get ready to pony up and here's the taxpayers that, that, uh, that are going to be affected. Um, <laughs> Let's and, be honest. Your hopes were raised. You read the headline and you were like, oh, maybe he gets it. And then you read the article. Yeah, well, but it's, prog it's progress. I mean, it's progress in the sense that at least now we're talking about taxpayers. At least we're now talking about, you know, Alaskans having to pay for something. Um, and uh, and 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 he he's right on the cusp, I think. Of, of, of getting it and, and starting down the road of an equally as important road of, you know, what are we going to spend it on and should we be spending it on that? An equally important road is, and who's going to pay for it if we go down that road and spend it? He's right on the cusp, I think. That headline gets us right to the cusp of addressing that second issue, but then he doesn't do it. So I, I think it's progress in the sense of Alaska reporting that Nat is out there with a headline that says taxpayers should get ready to pony up. I think it's progress that we're recognizing that it's taxpayers. It truly is taxpayers uh, that are going to get hit by that get hit by additional spending, whether it's for the Cook Inlet or for its, whether it's for K through 12 or whether it's defined benefits or whatever it is that that it's taxpayers who are getting hit. But but he needs to, and reporters generally need to take the next step and say, okay, taxpayers are getting hit. Which taxpayers are there? Which Alaskans are getting hit uh, with the burden of, of paying for these things? Great. Basically, who are taxpayers at this point? And uh, they don't want to acknowledge that it's a tax. They want to still say that we're all getting the free ride, as we talked about in the past, that that'll be the next step in the evolution of, oh, Alaskans are getting a free ride. You need to do it like just like every other state, and we should pay taxes at that point. You could see that that's coming. The buildup is already in the wind on that. But, I mean, it's good to see at least he's starting to be on the cusp of it. Uh, now, if James Brooks and some of the others were, you know, more intellectually honest on this and stop just regurgitating talking points, that would be a better thing. But, I mean, it's a major problem here in Alaska, Brad. Wouldn't you agree that we just don't have a, a fifth estate that is, is, you know, really asking the hard, doing what they're supposed to be doing, asking the hard questions of either side, being skeptical of all sides at this point? Uh, I think that's fair, Michael, uh, on on fiscal issues. I mean, I, I I'm sort of proud to see the pushback. Uh, the Alaska landmine had Ellie's uh, had Ellie Rubenstein's uh, uh, tape first, but then to see everybody else sort of, you know, look at the tape and give their own spin on it. I think that's I think that's a sign of pushback against against some of the some of what government wants uh, wants us to believe. Uh, government, broadly speaking, uh, government wants us to believe. 
some some sign that the that the fifth estate's pushing back. But on this in particular, I mean, so so let's 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 look at this headline. If Alaska wants more cooking and gas, taxpayers should get ready to pony up. If you look at the Elise Galvin version of this, the Alaska House Coalition uh, of this, it would be Alaska wants more cooking and gas. We just need to take some of our surplus um, and spend it on uh, on 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 that. I mean, that's that's the way they would want to spin it. Uh, right. I think I think it's good that Nat's pushing it at least that taxpayers should get ready to pony up. We just need to step forward and say, which taxpayers? Who pays? What? Where's the burden falling uh, on Alaskans? Who's who are the taxpayers uh, uh, and have the fifth estate step up and do that? I saw this headline, Brad, and I just I immediately thought of you and thought, boy, we should discuss this. Dunleavy is the fifth most popular governor in America. According to the Morning Consult poll, Alaska Governor Mike Dunleavy is the fifth most popular governor in America. They're known for these polls, obviously. The poll over the summer showed that Dunleavy was number 10, and then his popularity doubled. And he's even more popular than Dakota, South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem. So, I mean, I just, I mean, who, 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 is, I mean, is it Alaska? I mean, who is, I, I just don't even know at this point. I, um, Michael, Michael, what's going on, I think, is everybody else is sinking and Mike and, and Dunleavy is just sort of sticking, sticking where he, where he is. I mean, Kristi Noem had to deal with fiscal issues. She had to deal with, with taxes. South Dakota has taxes, folks. Uh, and, uh, and Christy Nome had to, uh, had to deal with those and, um, and, you know, had to, had to confront the fact that, you know, the, 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 the reality, fiscal reality exists. And so that sort of pulls her back. Oh my gosh. She has to deal with taxes. Dunleavy, though he denies it. And though he says, oh, we ought to be paying a full PFD. Dunleavy's riding this wave of using the PFD as, as a way of substituting for taxes as a substitute revenue source. So he doesn't have to press for taxes. And so, and so, you know, every time he gets close to it, the press, the press conference last year uh, where he said, oh, we're going to consider a sales tax. We'll have it out in the next day or two. And it never came. Uh, every time he gets close to it, he gets, you know, beat about the head and shoulders and, and, and he pulls back from it and he's not confronting it. And he's just riding. He's as bad in this respect as Elise Galvin, right? He's as bad in the sense that he's just riding the PFD down talking you know talking a good game about it but signing budgets that increase spending and reduce the pfd just writing it down and 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 avoiding having to confront the fiscal reality the state faces yeah. uh, and so that makes you popular when you don't have to talk i mean when you don't have to talk about that stuff christy has to well, talk I, about it and so she gets dinged for it i guess you're out of sight out of mind I mean, that's really what it's about. I mean, my criticism of my, I like Mike, I like Mike. Um, I like to stand in the beginnings. I, you know, I, I, but my main criticism of him for his entire tenure uh, after that first, you know, battering that he took over the budget cuts has been that he has been literally just absent from the fray. He has not been engaging the public. He has not been engaging his base. He he started for a short period of time there putting out those little governor video things that he did on Facebook, which were, you know, truly engaging and I think gave people an idea where he's at. And he has totally discounted that. He's not going on radio. He's not, you know, he's just like, he's absent from the scene. And, and I just, I think that is the biggest mistake that he could possibly make. And yet he continues to do it. And like you said, maybe he's just lame ducking it now, waiting for his next three years to turn over so he can run for Senate. I mean, that is, and it is so disappointing to the people who voted for him in the base. That's the worst part is that they're the ones that are disappointed. Does he think he's going to get their support if he changes office based on this track record? I, I just don't even know. Yeah, well... I mean, he's, as I say, he's skating, he's able to do that. He's able to be quiet because he doesn't, he, he's, he's allowing the PFD, allowing PFD cuts to, 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 to absorb the fiscal problems the state's, the state's dealing with. He's talking against it, but he's not doing anything about it uh, as it's going through the legislature. And he's just signing the budgets and not getting into controversial, you know, uh, tit for tats with the legislature, you know, yes, you shouldn't have spent that much, but you did. And so I'll sign it. Uh, you shouldn't have cut the PFD that much, but you did. And so I'll sign it. The most powerful, what, what many people say is the most powerful governor in the, in the, in the U S has the most power of any governor in the U S 
uh, is just rolling over, you know, just got round heels and right. just rolling over for whatever, whatever the legislature wants. So you go along, get along. You don't create a lot of headlines. You don't get people out there pushing back at you. You talk a good game about, oh, I'm, I stand for PFDs. Uh, but then you allow them to, to, to get cut and, um, and you, and you don't have any bad headlines that way. I mean, cause just roll over and wet on yourself at this point and it's all fine. I, mean, I wasn't, I wasn't going to say the latter. I, I'm going to do that. I'm going to say that. I mean, that's what it is. He had the opportunity. He blinked and he, and he just, he passed it. He just, he took the easy path at this point. Um, Gary, I don't agree with you. Gary says, I truly and sadly think it's time to move on from harping on the PFD. Unfortunately, the PFD is not going to be around in the new, in the too distant future. A sustainable budget should focus on finding those areas where the budget could be cut down. And <laughs> I mean, first, I, I disagree with all of that, but I mean, you know, Brad, I'll let you comment on it here in the last minute or so. Was Gary around in 2019? Was he, was he around for, for the debacle of 20, 2019? Yeah. And, and has he been around since when the governor hasn't taken a taken a stand since? You know, you and I, for for the entire 20 teens, we found all these places where the budget could be cut. And and what good did it do us? None. Um, the real, the real stopping point, the real thing that we have that would stop this is if the top 20% had to pay for part of the cost of government, they would push back. They would say, no, I'm not going to, I don't want taxes for that. I don't want taxes for this. I don't want taxes to go to Ellie for Ellie Rubenstein to travel over to Saudi Arabia. I, I just don't want, I don't want taxes, but they don't say that. And they don't say that because we've allowed the PFD to become the punching bag for, for increased spending and, and for how we fund until we stop yeah. that, until we stabilize the PFD and say, if we're going to spend the top 20% has got to spend also all companies are at risk for increased taxes to spend also until we stop that and, and switch it over to where people are at risk from increased spending. We won't get spending stopped and we'll continue to see the PFD erode. So to me, the PFD is the key. You get yeah. that up, you get that up and stop talking about it. We're done. Period. Yeah. Yeah. Statement. I agree with that. Brad, um, we're down to the last 90 seconds here or so, but let me just get a, a tease from you uh, or kind of a preview of your thoughts on the upcoming um, session. Because obviously we can <laughs> see with what Galvin's written and everybody signed off on, we can see the direction that this is going to be going. More money for education, defined benefits. I mean, these are going to be the talking points and the hit pieces. What do you think is going to happen this year? Um, boy, that's a – so it's an election year. I think there's going to be a huge push to spend – I mean, we're seeing it from both the Democrats and the Republicans. The Democrats want to spend on K through 12. George Rauscher and the Republicans want to spend on cook inlet gas uh, through giving subsidies and, and credits. Uh, the big push is going to be to, to spend. Uh, the governor has not demonstrated the ability to really hold the line against spending since uh, since uh, 2019. So I, I think I think we're going to have a big push for spending. I think we're going to have a big push for using PFD cuts to, to fuel that spending. Uh, and I think it's going to be, I think, I think we're going to declare success if at the end of that, if, if at the end of the session, they haven't enacted a statute that replaces the, the existing PFD statute. Well, we'll see what happens. They might be able to get it through. They may not. Uh, we'll see what happens. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board. As always, Michael, it's good to have you. Michael, as always, uh, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.